Good morning. My name is Jane Barrett, and it's my great pleasure to be moderator and part of this important session, Unlocking the Potential of Immunisation for All Ages. The Immunisation for All Ages initiative was established in 2018, and it brought together civil society and industry. Pfizer supported this initiative, which continues today. One of the important outputs of the initiative in 2018-2019 was the creation of the manifesto. And this manifesto is just as relevant today as it was in 2018. There'll be four speakers today focusing on four different issues of immunisation across all ages. And let me introduce them to you. Diane Thompson. Senior Director of Global Vaccines, Public Affairs, Pfizer. Professor Michael Moore, Chair, International Immunisation Task Force, past President, World Federation of Public Health Associations. And finally, Gonzalo Souza Pinto, Lead for Practice Development and Transformation, International Pharmaceutical Federation. The format of today's session is there's going to be presentations, brief presentations from four different people, followed by a panel discussion, and then we're opening the floor for questions. So we encourage you to actually stand up, go to the microphone and ask questions. Let us just talk about the four areas that will be discussed today. Firstly, the value of including and prioritising life course immunisation in national immunisation plans. Secondly, the link between healthy ageing, functional ability and adult vaccination. Third, the importance of maintaining vaccine confidence and uptake among eligible populations. And finally, the role of pharmacists in simplifying vaccine pathways, improving vaccination coverage and promoting a life course approach to vaccination. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Diane Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and I'm delighted to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk for the next few minutes on the preventable burden of respiratory diseases. And, you know, before we move into some of the detail of that, I wanted to just highlight three particular areas of the Immunisation for All Ages Calls to Action document or manifesto, as it's sometimes known. And that is to have three pillars around the work that each of the groups involved in the initiative align on and support. And that first one is to prioritise immunisation throughout all stages of life. Immunisation is very well established in infancy, but across the life course, there's some development needed. And they're saying very clearly that immunisation across the life course should be a key pillar of expanded prevention strategies and a central component of universal health coverage. The second is to remove barriers for appropriate immunisation across life to ensure that people are protected and not left behind. And that can be structural barriers as well as um, <clears throat> you know, infrastructure as well. The third one is to reduce inequities for timely, appropriate and affordable access to immunisation across the life course. And you're going to hear those pillars reflected in each of the presentations and discussions today. So the first thing that I'd like to look at is this slide here, which really looks at the co-circulation of vaccine-preventable respiratory diseases that occur during the winter season. This slide here is taken from WHO Europe last year, and it outlines the triple threat that um, is placed on not just individuals, but of healthcare systems and, of course, economies as we face the winter season. Each, each health system around the world has faced unprecedented challenge as a result of the pandemic. But now that the emergency phase of the pandemic is over, health systems are dealing with backlogs of care and they're still managing ongoing challenges with workforce capacity due to ongoing illness of their own teams. So when we come into winter, we need to think about the complete picture with regards to the respiratory burden. And this slide here outlines the triple burden of um, 
RSV, um, which is the um, pale green um, uh, uh, um, peak. Um, there's also the SARS-2 COVID cases in the dark blue and flu in the brown. Pneumococcal is not on here, but pneumococcal is the fourth. There's a quartet of respiratory diseases which adults in particular are vulnerable to. Pneumococcal pneumonia, RSV, influenza, and um, obviously COVID-19. And I guess we need to really think about this because this is pushing an additional burden as we go to the health, you know, the, the Northern Hemisphere winter. And we saw that earlier this year, Dr. Tedros said that it was time for countries to transition from emergency mode to ongoing management of COVID-19 alongside other infectious diseases. And the IFAA initiative, the members, out with Pfizer, the, uh, the members put forward this statement um, at the end of the public health emergency, really reinforcing that this was no time for complacency. And you can really see why when you look at this graph. And we also have this major call for increasing funding on prevention. And this is work of the International Longevity Centre in the UK, um, Mr David Sinclair, who apologises that he cannot be here today. And this is their prevention index work. And it clearly states that countries that spend more on preventative health care and immunisation perform better on their pre um, prevention index. And that's really looking at the, the total expenditure of prevention and the, the allocated budget that's disclosed for immunisation programmes. And you can see here, it's a really small percentage of the total prevention budget that's spent on immunisation. <clears throat> and in addition to that, if we think about the last data that came from OECD, I think it was in 2016 or 17, it outlined that the average spend um, of health systems on prevention across OECD member states was 3%, it was 2.8%. Um, so it's a really small proportion of total healthcare expenditure, and yet this is life-saving and highly cost-effective. And if we look at the, the shift that we need to undertake, we've got really significant challenges with an ageing demographic, but that also brings opportunities as well. And we need to really start reorientating our health systems to think about that shift from treating disease to preventing it across the life course. And as I said earlier, investing in vaccines saves time, money, lives, and leads to healthier and sustainable healthcare systems and communities. And it is very well established in infancy and in paediatrics. Um, but there is a need for immunisation at all stages of life. Adolescents, there's a particular burden of disease of meningococcal disease in adolescents. Um, some countries um, instigate an immunisation programme for young people going off to university against meningococcal disease. Pregnancy, we know that there's a burden of disease you know, in um, pregnancy to, to, from RSV, from group B streptococcus, as well as from influenza. So there is a real need for further investment and establishment of maternal immunisation programmes, adults, and of course, we've been speaking about older adults and we'll do so more today. And we understand that budgets are very constrained, but I think it's really important to think about the value that um, immunisation brings across the life course. Again, we need to think about protecting um, the most vulnerable, both in, in infancy and during pregnancy. And of course, maternal immunisation is established to protect the infant more generally. You know, that the, the, the newborns are you know, not able to manufacture their own antibodies in that first six months of life. Um, so that's why the protection they receive from their mothers is so important in that first few months of life until they're able to manufacture and build their own immune systems. So we also need to think about the impact that this has more broadly across society when you think about immunization at all stages of life. If you look at the flu during the 2019-20 season, um, 
in the US alone, there was 105 flu-associated hospitalizations avoided as a result of vaccination, and 6,300 deaths were modeled and estimated to be avoided. But I think we also need to really think about healthy aging and the importance of immunization and helping to build and maintain functional capacity. And Dr. Barrett will speak about that a little bit more during this presentation. But that really helps adults to remain economically active and to have fewer care requirements following an infection. And it does deliver a return on investment. I think WHO has outlined that vaccination um, and is a really cost-effective way of saving lives and promoting health and well-being. But the crucial point is that for every euro invested in adult immunisation, there is a four euro return on that investment. And everybody knows how cost-effective paediatric immunisation is, but it's less well known and recognised the value of adult vaccination. So that's a phenomenal return on investment. We also need to think about that investment in infrastructure and support for adult immunisation as part of preparedness for future health emergencies. We've just lived through a pandemic and the emergency phase of that pandemic it is likely that we or our children may have to face something similar in the future. So investing in the infrastructure and support for our health systems is a, is a really critical thing to do. And by investing in health system infrastructure for adult immunisation, it will not only help prepare for future pandemics, but it will also help build resilience and capacity in health systems now. So it's a short term and a longer term priority and importance. And I think that I also want to outline the importance of this in terms of productivity, because so many adults are actually maintaining um, you know, economic productivity and, and are working. So if we look at the, at the figures for that, you can see that there's an estimation of 7.83 billion increase in GDP um, when there is a, a high population of the, of the population is vaccinated. So that's the end of my presentation. I'll be delighted to take questions at the end of the session. And it's now my great pleasure to hand back to Dr. Barrett. Thank you, Diane. You know, that's a perfect segue for me to talk with you about realising the benefits of vaccination in maintaining function and healthy ageing. The IFA, International Federation on Ageing, is an NGO that represents about 70 million people with this very unique membership base, government, non-government, academic, industry and older people, because all of those stakeholders actually have to work together you know, to influence and shape policy. The IFA is 50 years old this year, and we started off with our mission to ensure the rights of older people, and that mission is no more important yesterday as it was today. You know, there are two major driving forces that make us pay attention to adult vaccination, and that's the rapidly ageing population around the globe, and also the increased prevalence of non-communicable diseases. So you and I and everybody else needs to be asking the question, why are the rates of adult immunisation so low in every single country of the world? The IFA advocates vertically and horizontally. And to advocate at a country level, horizontally, and vertically at the WHO and UN, etc., we need to understand the interconnections between intergovernmental agendas. Why? Because policy doesn't happen there. Policy happens at a national level. So we need to understand the linkages and be able to pull through the principles to enact in policy development at a national level. And here are four pretty clear examples of why we need to connect agendas. We have the UN Decade of Healthy Ageing, four action areas, long-term care, primary integrated care, age-friendly environments, combating ageism. We've got the immunisation agenda of 2030, SP4, 
life course integrated approach. You know, we have the World Health Organization's report on combating ageism, and we know that if you have a negative perception around older people and self-identifying, you know, that decreases your life expectancy. And then, of course, the big catch-up. The big catch-up happened this year, and it was a call for member states to look at their immunisation schedules and actually ensure investment across the life course. But the focus was on children. And that's not to say it's not important, it's vitally important. But we need to step back and assume responsibility for a life course approach to vaccination. We should be celebrating that in 2050, one in every six people will, will be over the age of 60 years. But we're not going to be, because not every one of those people will be healthy, and not every one of those people will have access to life-saving vaccines. So shame on us if we don't actually act. Because infections can and do accelerate functional decline of older people and vulnerable populations, such Indigenous people. But it does more than that. We've seen in COVID and previous pandemics, it impacts our healthcare system. Elective surgery has not yet caught up in many countries. It impacts our long-term care system and it impacts the informal network of caregivers that are fundamental to every single healthcare system around the world. And this graph is very clear. You know, cause of deaths, vaccine respiratory preventable diseases, and the kick up as we grow older. The term life course is used very liberally nationally and globally. But when we think about life course in the context of health, we're talking about function. And it's this all those attributes of an individual and the environment that intersect to create the opportunity to live the life that we choose to live. For example, you know, as babies grow and they grow into children, we're looking for developmental milestones. That's what we're looking for. That's the life course approach. And as we grow older, we're looking to maintain our autonomy, our independence, our, our function. So this context is important in the decade and immunisation agendas because we really want to actually focus on the functional ability of our population, which leads to healthy ageing. Now, functional ability and intrinsic capacity vary tremendously across our life course. And in the latter half of life, there are three common trajectories. They're not exclusive. First, high stable capacity, declining capacity, significant loss of capacity. And public health strategies and interventions such as vaccination vary across that. So for those with significant high capacity, we're looking at a really a prevention model in the home. You know, we're really, you know, the express need to mitigate the impact, but also we're thinking about the frontline workers, the healthcare workers that are really engaging in this most vulnerable population. And we know, you know, the uptake rates of vaccination for healthcare workers is not where it should be. In fact, it's poor. Now, the WHO has provided guidelines that say to us that a high-risk group are older people. And I think we'd all agree with that in terms of eligibility for vaccines, and in this case, COVID and influenza. But we also know, as I've mentioned, policy doesn't get, it doesn't happen at WHO. It happens at a national level. And this data shows us that Australia, United States, France, and one other, United Kingdom, um, you know, the eligibility is quite narrow, 65 and over. Now, you know, one of the comments in our rehearsal yesterday was, well, you know, that could be for government-funded vaccines. Well, the question that I would ask is, if an older person has to choose between electricity, food or a vaccination, what are they going to choose? They're going to choose 
electricity and food. But just look at the numbers around the years of life lost in that productive paid work. So 45 to 54, 55 to 64, the years lost. So 67 million total years life lost due to COVID. So that's part of our most productive life. But not to say that people over the age of 65 are not productive from an economic perspective, but also, you know, an informal perspective. So protecting additional years in good health provides all sorts of opportunities for the individual, but also for society. Long-term care. It's not a pretty subject, is it? I often say to people, hands up who would like to be in long-term care in their latter stages of life. And I don't, I don't see people jumping and say, pick me, pick me. We also know the devastating impact of COVID on residents, people, human beings living in residential care facilities. We know some of the reasons, but look at the numbers. You know, in 22 countries, about 50% of COVID deaths were those 80 years and over. That's if we were collecting the data, because at times we didn't collect the data from long-term care. I want you also to remember the cumulative COVID-19 deaths in 22 countries in the OECD, OECD were in long-term care. So the IFA sought to understand whether this was a once-off or whether there was something that we needed to do in terms of policy. 80% of those countries studied, 19 countries studied, did not have immunisation within the aged care plan. Why is this crazy? Because we need to connect you know, what's happening to the individual. And so having immunisation in the national aged care plan is absolutely imperative. You know, the other thing that we found, you know, was that 63%, yes, it was 63%, you know, identified older adults in their national immunisation plan. Sounds good, doesn't it? Two thirds. One third didn't. That's a problem. So what we're really calling for is governments include immunisation in long-term care in your national aged care plan. Seems pretty common sense to me. But the other aspect is really for civil society to play a much stronger role in influencing, helping to shape and inform the National Immunisation Technical Advisory Groups. So digging a little bit deeper, I take you back to the first couple of slides and I talked about life course approach and the importance of it. And Diane has already mentioned, you know, that there is a tension, rightly so, to children and maternal health, etc. But we really want to keep raising the attention around older people. And so the IFA sought to understand whether a life course approach was evident in the composition of NITAGs. So we studied 34 countries. We looked at using a TAPIC framework and the WHO functional process indicators to analyze this data. 9% of those studied have one representative, an expert in the field of geriatrics, gerontology, aging, adult vaccination. Now that doesn't mean that NITAGs are not doing their job, but it does mean that we have to pay attention to advocate for greater representation. And that is also the case with SAGE. There is not a representation across the life course on SAGE. But the study showed us a lot more too. You know, it was very difficult to actually find information about the governance structure, you know, the membership structure, how people were appointed, for how long they were appointed. And so the IFA proudly is now part of the WHO Global NITAG Network. And so civil society is beginning to play a much stronger role in understanding from the ground up how can we inform, you know, the NITAGs and all that goes around it. So there is strength. 
So the two recommendations was to improve the governance and accountability of NITAGs, and also we're calling on the introduction of a new process indicator to ensure that there is representation. In closing, I want to thank you for um, listening to what I had to say. You know, this is an important responsibility for each and every one of us, and the two calls to action I would ask you to consider in going out that door is recognise that immunisation is a crucial component of universal health care and the role of existing vaccines in supporting health, wealth and system sustainability. And could I suggest that's future vaccines also. And secondly, to ensure all countries have a national immunisation technical advisory group that includes representation from experts across the life course and civil society organisations. Thank you very much for your attention. Here are the references for this presentation. And it's now my great pleasure to hand the floor to Professor Michael Moore. Uh, thanks very much, Jane, and I'm uh, very proud uh, to be here. Note my disclosure on the slide. And what I'm going to continue to do is talk about uh, vaccine confidence, but particularly amongst eligible populations and specifically amongst uh, healthcare workers. Uh, I'm very proud to represent the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Uh, we have uh, about 120 membership organisations across the world that in turn uh, represent something in the order of 5 million public health professionals uh, and we are in official relations with the World Health Organisation uh, who we seek to influence. And our influence isn't just about uh, the World Health Organisation but our members at each uh, national level are also working to influence government. Uh, so let's have a quick look at our current levels of vaccine uptake and of course they've varied very much since 2020 uh, over uh, the COVID period uh, and specifically I want to look at them in terms of eligible populations and, uh, and healthcare workers. Uh, there has been a rise in vaccine hesitancy uh, across uh, almost all countries uh, since 2014 and unfortunately that has contributed to various serious disease outbreaks, and we could talk specifically uh, about, uh, about those. Um, it's interesting to have a look at the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines uh, in adults over, uh, over 60. You know, the uh, first dose, 92% uh, in some population, my own jurisdiction, uh, it was uh, almost 99% uh, of that first dose. And then uh, uh, the primary course and the others, we saw a significant uh, drop off. And I wonder how many people have had their full range of, uh, of uh, COVID uh, vaccine uh, uh, sitting here. Uh, and amongst the total population, of course, it was, uh, it was even less. So we had an example in terms of life course where adult vaccination became uh, extremely uh, important. But then apply that to uh, pneumococcal vaccination rates and compare the adult uh, levels to the paediatric level. So in the United Kingdom, 92% of uh, uh, children are vaccinated for pneumococcal uh, and yet adults, who it affects very, very seriously, uh, it's 44%. In the United States, comparison is 62, 88 and, uh, and so on. So we need to actually consider how it is that we go about ensuring that the vaccination rate for uh, adults don't lag behind that of, uh, of children. And part of getting there is about vaccine confidence. Uh, and so vaccine confidence really comes with a good understanding that A, vaccines work, B, they're safe. Uh, and a lack of vaccine confidence, of course, is one of the major factors that has contributed to, uh, to hesitancy. Uh, so it's interesting that uh, even though a priority group of, uh, that we work on of health workers, uh, more than a third of the countries did not achieve 70% uh, of COVID vaccine in healthcare workers. Uh, and uh, yet this was uh, so fundamental to not only protect themselves, uh, but also their work 
and the people with whom they were uh, working. Uh, and we, know, we do know that when uh, healthcare workers are vaccinated, they're less likely to uh, uh, fall ill uh, they'll be, uh, and be unable to work, the impact of which is very significant looking just at the hospital uh, sector, because when people are not there for work, the first thing that suffers in the hospital sector is almost always elective surgery. So people who have waited many years uh, for elective surgery now wait much longer because healthcare workers were, uh, were not uh, vaccinated. And this is even more significant in, in low and middle income uh, countries. And that's where a particular uh, concern is that, uh, that despite this being a priority group, along with uh, older people, indigenous people, migrants, refugees, and so forth, um, more than a third of countries didn't even achieve 70% 70, 70 vaccination coverage of their healthcare workers. And uh, in low-income countries, uh, the healthcare workers who are fully vaccinated, 33%. Uh, and then we look at lower uh, middle-income countries, 83, 79, and then higher-income countries, we're talking about 88%. So there really is a very big gap here, a very uh, uh, concerning inequity across the, uh, across the system. And we have a chance now, as we move out of the COVID emergency phase as we move more broadly to look at how to apply the, the lessons learnt in terms of, uh, of uh, immunisation. The World Federation of Public Health Associations decided to investigate really what was happening in uh, health systems and through vaccination and following that decided that it was important to develop a policy. Now when we develop a policy it came through the task force that I chair went to the Governing Council, was approved there, and then went to all our members at an uh, annual general meeting before it was approved uh, and, uh, and published. And what we do with it then is to get it out to our member organisations in each country, encouraging them to, uh, make, uh, uh, to apply what's in it to uh, their governments. And what it's about primarily is protecting the healthcare workforce in low and middle income countries. And, and provide key evidence-based recommendations uh, to develop and implement successful vaccination programs. And that's available uh, on the World Federation of Public Health Associations website uh, for anybody to see, wfpha.org. So what is the overall effectiveness of the healthcare system in the, in the sense of being enhanced through vaccination? Uh, an increase in influenza vaccination in healthcare workers by 10%, just a 10% increase, delivers a 10% decrease in sickness and absences. So this is in healthcare workers. But don't forget, you can apply exactly the same thinking across in productivity terms to workers right across the, uh, the uh, system. But uh, as I mentioned, the impact that has on having unvaccinated healthcare workers is not just the spread of disease between those and the people they're caring for, but it's the impact on the health system as well through, uh, through absences and therefore a reduction in the care that is needed for their, uh, for their patients. The other thing that is really fundamental is the issue of trust when it comes to vaccination. And uh, as a former politician, that was 20 years ago, can I uh, just point out that the trust level for politicians is quite different from the trust level for healthcare professionals. And it's very nice to have made that transition uh, my, uh, myself. And when we, whether it's our pharmacists, whether it's our doctors, whether it's nurses, uh, healthcare workers, allied health professionals, people ask them about vaccination about uh, what is and when they're well informed when they are uh, able to share the information as trusted members of the community who have knowledge then there is a significant increase around the uh, around the uh, the globe and it's a, a, a an ability to influence uh, not just your own family and the members around you but uh, people in the broader community. So let's just use a specific obstetrics 
support, and, uh, and particularly with uh, midwives. And so uh, vaccine approved use in pregnancy, particularly to protect the child in the, uh, in the first three months, becomes absolutely f uh, fundamental, whether it's pertussis, tetanus, uh, COVID-19, RSV. Uh, and a study in the United Kingdom showed that uh, where midwives were leading in terms of vaccination, the increase of uh, a rate for uh, influenza was 79% and pertussis by 91%. I mean, these are really, really significant uh, increases uh, that, uh, that uh, play a, an important role. And in that case, it wasn't just that they were providing advice, but they could also provide the vaccination. So there was ease of access. And my colleague, uh, um, uh, Gonzalo, will spend a bit of time talking about ease of access in terms of pharmacies in a uh, short while. And we see examples here that you can read from Japan and the uh, United States about increasing uh, vaccine uh, uptake in pregnancy, quite low, uh, but an increase in Japan, but in the United States, um, an increase of 49.3% uh, uh, in terms of uh, the COVID vaccine in 2021. So how do we go about improving vaccination uptake and confidence amongst healthcare workers? So we're being really specific about healthcare workers. Making sure there's equitable access, making sure there's appropriate funding. Nowhere is this more important than in um, low and middle income countries. Uh, for example, students, medical students, as they're completing their course, should be able to just access vaccination as part of their thinking, as part of their study. And providing support with the data that is, uh, is needed uh, and engaging with community leaders. Uh, often they're medical, but they might be religious. Uh, they might be uh, um, from, for example, service clubs. Uh, maintaining a, a focus on high risk health care and vulnerable health care workers, those who are working with uh, people who are likely to uh, have uh, some form of uh, disease, depending on the particular need for the vaccination. But we want a systematic, step-by-step -step approach to vaccine uh, advocacy and to maintain and build uh, uh, more effective uh, vaccine uh, policies. Now, how do we do a step-by-step -step advocacy approach? And here's a sequential method of, uh, of doing it. Um, and the first part is to establish a sense of urgency. Um, you know, having been a former health minister, can I tell you that uh, four or five ideas would come to me a week that I had to reject because A, we didn't have the money, uh, but B, because I had a higher priority. And if it's not urgent, that's not where your priority is going to be. Uh, secondly, uh, advocacy is in, done most effectively when there's groups. And so you build a, a guiding coalition. Uh, and as part of it, you ensure that the relationships remain, whether it's with the media, whether it's with bureaucracy, whether it's with, uh, with uh, politics. And there's no point doing this unless you have a clear idea about what it is that you want to change. And you're able to communicate that very effectively not only with the people you're trying to influence, but more broadly, whether it's social media, uh, broadly in the, uh, in the media, and then uh, trying to bring others with you to, um, and, and as I use a phrase, empower broad-based action. The one of these that's not sequential is being opportunistic. You can't actually be opportunistic in a sequential way. It's when you're standing at the football field watching your uh, child, in my case, grandchild, play footy, uh, and you see the uh, politician who's your local member just there. What a great opportunity. You already know what your clear vision is, and you've got the opportunity just to say a few words without interrupting the football game uh, too much. Um, uh, and certainly not uh, interrupting the concentration on their own child. Um, people often talk in politics about politicians only think to the next election. And there's an element of truth, a big element of truth of that. But almost all politicians that I've met, and a lot, ha see themselves as having a long-term vision. But you can't achieve that vision unless you get elected next time. So whether it's funding support, rather than the outcome, the output instead of the outcome, 
you need to actually support it. And most importantly, as an advocate, you need to acknowledge when somebody's made a step in the right direction and give them credit for it. And the other, uh, the ninth element here is the one of persistence. And uh, Rob Moody, a professor of uh, public health at Melbourne University, says there's only three, there's three P's that apply to advocacy, and they are persistence, persistence, and persistence. And, uh, and that's really worth keeping in mind because public health advocacy doesn't happen uh, overnight. So, and finally, to uh, incorporate those uh, changes uh, into, the, uh, into the culture. So, my final slide is about uh, the calls to action as part of the Immunisation for All Ages group uh, is to increase public confidence in vaccines, driving health-seeking behaviour, communicating the value of immunisation through trusted stakeholders, and particularly, as I've talked about today, those stakeholders who are healthcare professionals, allied health professionals, uh, and, uh, and so on. I say to um, healthcare professionals, remember that doctors do save lives, and nurses, and police, and, uh, uh, and uh, paramedics, but we as public health professionals, we also save lives. The difference is we do it a million at a time. And I think COVID taught us that. Our final uh, point is to ensure uh, existing vaccine uptake targets are met and we strive for consistent vaccination targets of 90% throughout life. Now, I do not understand why it is, for example, the World Health Organisation and others say for adult uh, vaccination, we should aim for 70%, but for paediatrics, over 90%. Why? We should be actually aiming for 90% right through uh, the, uh, through the life course, and here's, uh, my references are included there. And it's now my great pleasure to hand over to my colleague, my friend, uh, um, just here, who is uh, um, Gonzalo Sousa Pinto to uh, continue. Thank you, Gonzalo. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Michael, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Sosa Pinto, as Michael introduced me. I'm with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP, as lead for practice development and transformation. It is my great pleasure to uh, address the, all of you the session today. And as my predecessors on the panel have addressed, uh, we, it's a common, uh, a shared understanding that high coverage rates of vaccination across all ages are beneficial not only to individuals from across the ages, but for health systems, for societies as a whole. And we have a, a well-established evidence and powerful arguments to justify that. Uh, and I think that my presentation will address or make some contributions in terms of the how we might uh, achieve that in terms of improving access, mobilizing populations to uh, become more aware of the value of vaccines for in each individual and for each population group, and how we might actually simplify um, uh, vaccination pathways. So uh, FIP, the International Pharmaceutical Federation, uh, was established in 1912. We are a, a the global organization representing pharmacists uh, as a healthcare profession, but also pharmaceutical scientists and pharmaceutical educators. We are a federation of 156 now, since a couple of weeks ago, uh, since our Congress. Um, 156 national associations and organizations of pharmacists uh, working in community pharmacies, hospital pharmacies, the pharmaceutical industry, in administration, in policy making, in a variety of practice settings as well. And we work to support the development of the pharmacy profession through practice development and, and also in emerging, incorporating emerging scientific innovations through developing the pharmacy workforce uh, through appropriate education to meet the needs of our populations, the healthcare needs of our populations and health systems. And FIP has been prioritizing the role that pharmacists can play and do play uh, in the vaccination space. Uh, and this, this role is broad and multi-factorial, uh, uh, and it includes 
uh, providing evidence-based advice on vaccines and improve health literacy and vaccination literacy as well, uh, but also addressing through uh, significant conversations with our communities, with individual patients and individuals, uh, address any concerns that they may have about vaccines, about the safety, the efficacy of vaccines, addressing hesitancy uh, and complacency about vaccines. We're also playing a role, and this is an increasing role, uh, in administering vaccines and other injectable medicines, uh, but also even in prescribing vaccines um, uh, to facilitate and, and, um, and uh, simplify the vaccination pathway that a patient needs to go from the decision to actually get vaccinated until they actually get the jab in their arms, and in managing vaccination records. Uh, so this, this is just an example of a recent publication uh, of FIP supporting live course immunization through pharmacy-based vaccination, enabling equity, access, and sustainability. This is a uh, one of our recent publications that you may find on our dedicated microsite, fip.org slash vaccination. And just to provide you an, a few examples uh, or of, for example, the role that pharmacists played during the pandemic in delivering vaccinations. Uh, and in, in some of the countries that you see on the screen, like France or the United States, actually pharmacists delivered more than half of all doses of COVID-19 vaccines to the population. So if this is not a significant contribution to bringing the pandemic under control, I don't know what is, because it's really facilitating uh, the engagement with populations, providing an easy point of access to the vaccination service. Uh, and you see the countries and the figures of the, the, the number of doses that were administered in, in a variety of countries. Uh, and you see that those countries that with the green, with a green tick uh, on them uh, are those that actually allowed pharmacists to prescribe this vaccine. So this means that the patient did not have to go to see their GP or a, a, a prescriber to get a prescription for the vaccine, go to the pharmacy to get the, the vaccine, uh, and then go back to uh, a nurse or, a, another, or their GP to get the vaccine administered to them. I mean, the pathway is so convoluted that you miss out on uh, most patients uh, uh, or most individuals who were in the beginning to start with, they were Ill willing actually to get vaccinated. So on one hand, we're talking about hesitancy and, and, and on the other hand, we have individuals that are motivated to actually get vaccinated and we just develop so complicated pathways to, for them to access vaccination services that we are somehow, there's a, a little bit of a paradox here. So pharmacies do provide uh, um, an easy, convenient uh, uh, pathway to uh, vaccination services. And, and this was just an example that the pandemic made very, very evident in the eyes of the population and policymakers as well. Um, but FIP has been monitoring the role that pharmacists play in vaccination, in the vaccination space, for over a decade, well over a decade actually, um, and through surveys and in, with, in dialogue with our member organizations that describe the situation in their countries, uh, we have uh, understood that Currently, there are at least 48 countries in the world that have a regulated pharmacy-based vaccination, where people can go to a pharmacy and be vaccinated. Of course, there's many shades uh, of this authority, um, but an interesting this could play in this space and to leverage uh, pharmacies' accessibility and expertise and convenience for uh, country-level vaccination strategies. Uh, the same has been happening in terms of prescribing. What I was just mentioning, that the pharmacist can assess the individual situation of the person coming to the pharmacy, understand whether that person, what age group they are, what other underlying conditions they might have, so that they can, what medication they are coming to the pharmacy to pick, so they can understand what benefits, what vaccines, what specific vaccines this individual might benefit from or might be eligible for. So 
And in, in doing that assessment, when there are clear eligibility criteria and protocols in place, they can very clearly decide, yes, this person is eligible and would need or would benefit from this vaccine. So that's the prescribing. So uh, the, 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 the alternative to that is saying, so no, sorry, now you understand that you need the vaccine, but you need to visit your GP or your doctor, get a prescription, come back, and I'll provide the vaccine to you, and then you go back to someone else to, admin to have it administered. It just doesn't make sense. So we see that an increasing number of countries has been granting prescribing authority and establishing these clear eligibility protocols and guidelines for pharmacists to, be, to confidently prescribe these vaccines to the individuals coming to the pharmacy. And this uh, not only applied to the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, but also to other vaccines, including influenza, but also meningococcal and DTP boosters and, and other vaccines. And to provide you just an example of a country that has been a, a, a very interesting case study uh, for multiple reasons, for the quick evolution in terms of uh, the situation and the role that pharmacists play in vaccination uh, and has, been, has really become an outstanding example that we often use. Uh, and it's, it's France, of course. Uh, and before 2017, French pharmacists did not, have, uh, did not play an active role in vaccination. And this was introduced in a pilot study in 2017 in two regions, which was so successful and so well valued by the population, by the health system, that it was rolled out na nationally uh, between 2018 and 2019. And that was only for influenza. And, but the workforce was developed, the competence was developed, the framework was established, and therefore when the pandemic came, the French health uh, authorities realized, yes, we have a wonderful network of accessible healthcare professionals that can deliver these vaccines. So let's, let's use, let's, let's leverage this network and also engage with them in terms of the vaccination, uh, uh, COVID vaccination strategy. And they introduced uh, COVID vaccination at pharmacies as well in 2021. And following that, in 22 and 23, this was expanded to all non-live vaccines for patients um, um, uh, of most age groups from, from pediatric influenza, uh, from uh, vaccination to older adults, and, and also prescribing authority for these vaccines. And it was also expanded to pharmacy technicians who are adequately trained and certified to administer uh, vaccines. Um, and when what we challenge and what we invite policymakers to consider is these three elements that respond to the question, why pharmacies? Why pharmacies are accessible, they are trusted by the population, and they are knowledgeable. Um, the convenience of access is fundamental when you're talking about a preventive uh, intervention like a vaccine. So if it's not easy, convenient, and people can do it on the way home, near, near where they live, through a simple, simple pathway, people will just postpone it, they will not think, yeah, I can do it later, or I'll do it when I have the time. No, it needs to be accessible, it needs to be convenient, and pharmacies not only are nearby our, own, our homes in most countries, there's a pharmacy within five minutes from, from your home, but also, um, they have long opening hours and they are opening on the weekend. So open when other facilities that normally administer vaccines might be closed or might have uh, a, a, a wait time uh, for, for that. And that's, that's the other issue. I mean, we are adding so much pressure to primary care centers, to general practitioners to manage, to administer a vaccine when this could, that time uh, could be used for other patients that actually have uh, most, most severe needs or uh, and more complex uh, health situations that actually require the GP time. And let pharmacies do that. Let's reduce the pressure on primary care centers and general practitioners and, and nursing practitioners. Uh, and pharmacies can take that and contribute to more efficient and more sustainable health systems, reduced uh, waiting times. Uh, and pharmacies are also trusted in every single satisfaction uh, poll that you do to the population. 
they, I mean, they, they know that they come to the pharmacy, they ask when whatever concerns they might have about vaccines, about their medicines, about their health. I mean, it's, it's sort of a first point of contact with the health system. And then if, if it's something that actually requires that they, they see a doctor, then the pharmacist will be the first one to refer them to the appropriate professional. So there's, this trust needs to be leveraged as well. And then knowledgeable. Um, pharmacists are highly trained, highly educated professionals. In all these 48 countries, there's not a single pharmacist that puts a jab into a, the arm of a patient without having gone through the appropriate education and training and certification by the professional regulators. So, um, this, and this is, someone who is, you can just walk in uh, and you don't have that for other health professions. So the accessibility to a knowledgeable healthcare professional uh, is, is really makes a difference. But of course, in our surveys and our dialogues with our member organizations, we see that there's still many countries that do not have pharmacy-based vaccination and they face uh, some barriers, including a, a lack of recognition of pharmacists as service providers uh, and, and in including them in vaccination strategies. There's a certain ambiguity or even uh, confusion uh, around what prescribing means in that context, uh, a lack of uniformity in laws uh, regarding pharmacy-based vaccination within the same country, um, or a lack of uh, documentation of some of these services because of a lack of access to vaccination records, that needs to be uh, definitely addressed, uh, and lack of communication and coordination among stakeholders involved in vaccination services. And of course, in some countries where the authority to vaccinate is not yet there, then pharmacists are not yet being educated and training for those roles. So we are working with academic institutions so that the regulatory and the education and workforce development move in parallel. But uh, there's also important enablers, uh, and that's leveraging the public's acceptance of pharmacy-based vaccination as a convenient and accessible way to receive vaccines, recognizing the role of pharmacists in advocating vaccination and addressing vaccine hesitancy. All these people that come to the pharmacy that had not even thought that they might need a vaccine or that there might be a vaccine that would uh, keep them safe and retain their functional ability and their quality of life. And pharmacists can raise this awareness and build this uh, trust in vaccines. Um, enhancing pharmacy education curriculum to include education and training. This is happening in many countries. In many countries, these are, have become components of undergraduate pharmacy education across all pharmacy schools. Uh, in other countries, it's, uh, it's complementary, uh, um, continuing professional education. Um, granting pharmacists access to patient vaccination records, it's fundamental so that or not only we can see the gaps in vaccination of each individual, but we can actually register the interventions and the vaccines that are administered, and collaborating with policymakers and healthcare professionals to update the legislation and guidelines to set clear policies uh, in place. And here on the right side of the screen, I would just like to highlight a document that was published uh, last year by FIP. It's the FIP commitment to leveraging pharmacists to build vaccine confidence and address vaccine hesitancy and complacency. This was a statement by FIP committing ourselves, our profession, to take on this role and this responsibility of building uh, vaccine confidence. And we invited a range of organizations, not only from pharmacy, but mostly from outside the pharmacy space, to actually support and endorse and recognize this role by pharmacists. And there's 23 global and international organizations, including the World Federation of Public Health Associations, including IFA, the International Federation on Aging, and many other partners that have recognized this important role. And just more recently, uh, just a couple of weeks ago as well, uh, in September, FIP, the FIP Council, our General Assembly, adopted unanimously this new statement of policy on the role of pharmacy in life course vaccination, uh, which includes various sets of recommendations for different stakeholders. Uh, and uh, I just brought here a few uh, recommendations to policymakers, uh, which include to develop formal vaccination schedules that support life course vaccination, 
uh, recognize, enable and fully harness the potential and convenience of community and hospital pharmacies for vaccination strategies to develop country appropriate policies and remove those barriers that I mentioned in the previous slide adopt new vaccination policies which will authorize and empower pharmacists not only to administer but to prescribe vaccines, promote the competence of pharmacists in these roles, uh, invest in, pre in prevention strategies. Uh, we've seen uh, previously that the investment in prevention strategies and particularly in vaccination remains incredibly low when the evidence supports a high uh, return on investment on, on vaccines and vaccination. Um, but also, of course, when you think and engage pharmacies to develop this important service for public health and for population health, you need to provide the appropriate incentives, and this work needs to be recognized and sustained by appropriate remuneration models. So we also claim that, of course, uh, in order for these services to be sustainable, but also to be equitable, because that cost cannot be transferred to the person receiving the vaccine. So, it needs to be covered by third-party payers uh, uh, that make that service uh, sustainable. So include pharmacists in plans for emergency preparedness and response, as I've just alluded to uh, in terms of our role in the pandemic, uh, and foster the full integration of, of pharmacies in healthcare systems by establishing effective immunization information mm -hmm. systems as well. So just to highlight and finalize the presentation, uh, uh, highlight two more calls to action from our manifesto. Um, FIP is greatly proud and thankful for the partnerships that we have developed through the Immunization for All Ages initiative. Uh, two calls to action or two uh, that we have included in our manifesto. One of them is to expand existing and innovate new infrastructure for immunization beyond the traditional pathways to facilitate and increase access to vaccination services, including pharmacies, and increase investment on prevention, and within that, increase the proportion of investment in immunization. And here are the references that support uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gonzo, but also to Michael and Diane. I think one of the unique aspects of the immunisation initiative is that we come together from different perspectives with a common agenda. But as you could see throughout the presentations, it's about the unequivocal support for each other's um, agendas because we know that that's going to be guiding and supporting you know, improved infrastructure, but also improved uptake rates. So now is the time, thank you to all of the speakers to keeping on time, that we have an opportunity to hear from you, your questions, but also to have some panel discussions. So I understand that we have microphones, is that right? Thank you. So if you'd like to um, ask um, the panel questions, Please, I encourage you to go to the, um, the microphone up there, the standing microphone. It would be helpful if you could say your name and where you're from. That sometimes provides some context. And uh, I think that we'll start with a question and then we'll go backwards and forwards with the um, um, panel. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is very insightful. Uh, I'm Baron. Ohm. The director of the European uh, Organization of Specialist Nurses. And what I really appreciate is the contextual domain, like Diana said. So often we hear the nurses are, have low uptake and they do not get involved, and there is a very negative uh, connotation to that. So we did a survey on this, so why is that? And said, well, we're not involved, we're not a part of the puzzle, and uh, we, are, we are excluded. And as a concrete example, during the COVID, when I was still working in the clinic, I said, well, we are our organization, we did a survey, we did a guide, with this communication information guide on vaccination and all. Uh, what, shall I do something? And then they said, no, the general petition is doing it. In a hospital of 60, 50, 600 beds, 1,000 workers, and she said, oh, that's the person you have to listen to. So there was this doctor who says, well, I tell you one thing, get your jab, because I tell you to. So this is a bit of a, sure. 
bridge we have to cross. So I really I'd like to uh, do more, go more in depth. To, to this, so, and I would like to hear my, my, Michael Moore because you're so passionate on, the, on, on, on this. So, for its two reasons, is the ESNO, our organization, also eligible to join your, your organization? And how would you respond to uh, finding out ways why is this low uptake and crossing this bridge? Okay. Thank you very much for your question. So, Michael, it's really to understand how do we get to that professional association level you know, and understand the barriers that they're experiencing. And I think that any time somebody says, well, you just have to do it because I said so, uh, is not a really effective uh, method of, uh, of getting people to do anything. Uh, and one of the fears people have is about adverse incidents. Uh, and that has to be addressed because they do occur. They're much, much, much and minuscule uh, uh, impact compared to the disease itself. Uh, however, that has to be explained and the evidence provided. And nurses, uh, along with other healthcare professionals, will expect the evidence. That's how, the, that's how they're educated. That's how they want to be educated. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's an Im that is the most effective way of reaching out to them. And remember when we reach out to nurses and we provide the evidence and we explain, what we get is a huge group of people who have the evidence, who can explain to others, and who are trusted. And that trust element, I, I keep going back to it, it is so, it is, uh, so important. Um, in terms of your organisation, uh, based within Europe, we also have a European-wide UFA, uh, which is a, associated with the World Federation of Public Health Associations. But we do have our associations that are national public health associations, but we also have as membership uh, organisations like yours uh, as part of the World Federation of Public Health Associations and, uh, and we would certainly uh, welcome applications along those lines, as I'm sure UFA, the European and Public Health Associations, uh, would as, uh, as well. I hope I've answered your question. OK, um, catch, catch yeah. Michael at the break, all right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and I'm, I'm, sh I'm certain that there are other aspects as well about culture, etc., and, and and workload. But let's keep going with the questions. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations. My name is Tina Regiantz, and I work for World Health Organization on antimicrobial resistance. Um, I recently saw a presentation um, that showed that only 2% of national action plans uh, combating AMR uh, considers or aligns with the immunization plans. So I would be very, very curious to hear your thoughts about potentially how could this be changed. Vaccines is a very powerful tool yep. uh, against <laughs> primary and secondary infections. Um, and, and how would you sort of incorporate this aspect moving forward into your, um, into your activities? Advocacy. Or, I mean, is it something that's been discussed? Because in my view, it's, it's, it's one of the low-hanging fruit that could really help combat an uh, expanding and very scary scenario. Yeah. And before I hand it to the, the panel, it's very interesting because IFA has done a little work in this area. It's very difficult to get that work funded from a policy perspective and also from an expert that I talked with, he said, how can you measure the value of vaccinations and aim? So, you know, it's, so we can talk also. But um, I Diane. Should, I should mention just a few months ago, a publication came out that showed that increasing use of, of vaccines could prevent almost half a million deaths due to AMR globally. Yeah. Yep. Yep, look, so, I, I, absolutely. Um, we've got to get it down to, to a national level. I'd like uh, Diane to respond to that. Thank you. Happy to, and we're aligned. You know, we, we agree completely. I, I guess the view that we've all discussed as a group is that EMR is, is really an important um, pillar for vaccination strategies. I guess the evidence question is really challenging. There's good evidence in paediatrics, particularly for pneumococcal vaccination, that there is a, a direct impact on item antimicrobial um, resistance. I guess for more broad um, uh, you know, approaches to this, we really need to be pragmatic and really look at it as a, 
a common sense approach. Because if you reduce the level of circulation of infectious disease, you reduce the number of infections that people have, you thereby reduce the need for antibiotics, thereby impacting antimicrobial resistance. So we're completely aligned. I, I would say two things across the life course that also take, across of, take account of AMR. We should not be having separate strategies um, you know, that are siloed. And it would be really great to see this you know, as part of an integrated approach moving forward. And you know, we, we, we are aligned and we support what you say. Michael? Uh, well, I support the same thing. You know, uh, in public health, there's a, always a paradox. The more successful you are, the less people uh, seem to think they need you. Uh, and, uh, and that's actually really challenging, and it applies here as, uh, as well. I was really, your information about only 2% of uh, plans in, uh, immunisation plans include uh, AMR has taken me a bit by surprise. I'm a bit shocked because, like Diane, I'm on the same wavelength. Okay. Yeah, Look, we have. I, maybe I should clarify. I mean, immunisation is international, but but they are not aligned. Yeah. I mean, there's no, no communication okay. between the night tags and. The, yeah, and, and the but but that's Thank unfortunately you. the case across government and also across WHO. So it's about for us to make the connections. We have yeah. four people to ask questions. So could, could you keep, keep short? Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name is uh, George Vredenberg from the United States. I chair something, a newly formed organization called the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. So this would be an effort basically to put in place a global mechanism to, uh, to, to go after a non-infectious pandemic. Uh, we also have a working group on Alzheimer's vaccines, uh, of both companies and regulators, to try and understand the challenges in particular of identifying uh, how regulators would approach uh, the approval of a vaccine well in advance of symptomatic disease. I am, my question goes to whether or not you've had experience uh, in immunization of non-infectious conditions and what the uptake rate might be with respect to a population that is not necessarily universal, but which would be defined as an at-risk population. Okay, thank you very much, George. I'll take the second question and then we'll return back to the panel. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ustea. I'm representing the International Youth Health Organization and I'm also a part of Lithuanian Medical Students Association. So thank you firstly for the very informative session. We are currently with Lithuanian Medical Students Association writing a resolution for the government uh, to have government funded uh, tick-borne disease vaccine. So this is a very informative session for that. But my question is that we are talking about immunization for all ages, uh, but um, in some ages, the person is not responsible for his own wants and needs. So I'm talking about infancy and childhood. So uh, my question is basically, how can we uh, battle uh, fake news uh, regarding uh, vaccination and immunization so that parents and caretakers of children and infants uh, would vaccinate uh, their children and would uh, provide a safety base for their, uh, for their health? Okay. Thank you very much. I'll stop you there just for a moment and we'll go back to, you know, the first question was from George, um, a newly established organisation. Uh, George, I might have it wrong, but Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative. Okay, almost there. So anybody would like to take uh, George's question on, which is, you know, very important, particularly now. The, the one vaccination that comes to my mind is sort of associated with, uh, with infectious disease in one sense, but not in another, and it's varicella. So chickenpox, yes, but at, uh, as shingles, it's not a infectious disease. And we vaccinate, uh, and actually we have two vaccines uh, with regard to shingles. Uh, and it's a very, very nasty disease, particularly in older people. And, uh, and so um, I note that in my own country in Australia, uh, somebody who's over, I think it's 65 now, uh, they have one of the vaccinations is available for free. Uh, the other one you have to pay for. Um, and so it, 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 there is a example, I think, of where we are vaccinating for a 
non-infectious disease in the sense in older people, yes, you've had chickenpox and we've, uh, and we've vaccinated for the varicella virus, but it's how it affects you later. So I think that's the, the answer uh, to your question, but I'm happy to uh, have some more thought you know, about I, it. I, well. I think the real challenge, though, that we've found is what is the narrative? What is the reason? Yeah. Who are you talking to? What's the message that you want to convey about this vaccine and, and, and the consequences if you're not vaccinated? So I think yeah. it's a relatively new area, George, but I know that there's people in, in Italy that are working in this area as well, so happy to respond. Um, I want to turn to Gonzo about fake news. Because your front line, you know, in all the questions that are asked from, from consumers, and I, I think it does speak to this question about, you know, infants and children, but also people with decision-making disabilities, such as those with Alzheimer's. How do pharmacists combat this fake news, the Dr Google that most of us go to from time to time? Thank you, Jane, uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, indeed, while we, while we might not have the possibility of engaging in, with a dialogue with an infant or, uh, or someone of, of all, uh, of, that might not make the decisions for themselves, their mothers and their caretakers and their parents, and, and our, they do come to the pharmacies with all those questions. Uh, so, it, and even if they do not have, if they do not come to the pharmacy or to a GP or a nurse, to uh, any healthcare professional with those questions, we identify them clearly as a young parent or uh, a, a someone who is pregnant or a pregnant individual. Uh, so we can proactively start those conversations and raising awareness about the vaccination needs. I mean, for example. Um, and and as, as Michael was, was, was saying, I mean, uh, a young uh, pregnant individual might have all the alarms on. I mean, should I be t putting this into my body? What effect might it have? Is it safe? Is it needed? Does it make sense? Uh, are there alternatives to that? So all those questions come to mind. And of course, when someone who is visibly pregnant or is coming to the pharmacy to ask for a product that suggests pregnancy, for example, you have there a, a wonderful opportunity to initiate one of those meaningful conversations about writing the, uh, asking the right questions and using the right type of language, depending on who is coming to you and their level of health literacy, to really address those uh, concerns that they may have and, and suggest uh, the, the appropriate approaches uh, in terms of vaccines that are recommended. Okay. Thank you, Gonzo. Sir, your Thank question. You. Thank you. My name is uh, Mohamed Abdulaziz. I head the uh, Department of Disease Control and Prevention at the Africa CDC in uh, Addis Ababa. So my, my question really, and uh, you've answered the, since my second question, the demand uh, components were fake news and uh, other form of, um, um, of um, uh, miscommunication affects the ability of our people to go and take this vaccination. The COVID-19 vaccine is uh, one example. But let's come back again to the supply end of this uh, vaccine, especially as the African context. Uh, we've seen during the uh, uh, pandemic that Africa was last in the area of supply for this. Um, and we also envisage for the life cause vaccine, it will follow the same uh, pattern. But uh, the equity component is, uh, if you take um, um, uh, cervical cancer, for instance, and have, um, uh, HPV vaccine, I mean, it's, it will do, the impact will be greatest on the African continent. So my question in this regard is, how do we address this equity issue? Uh, if, if you have any thoughts that you can share with us in to ensure that um, uh, there is equity when implementing this life course uh, uh, vaccination, that's one. Then the second is, um, do you have any idea how it has affected, um, uh, maybe in any country, the implementation of routine immunization uh, when you're doing the life course uh, uh, series? Because when I saw the data you presented, uh, uh, vaccination for pneumonia, uh, pneumococcal in, uh, in uh, in children in Europe is mostly above 80 percent. In Africa, we'll be happy to get uh, uh, 80 percent coverage for even the most dangerous pathogens among childhood. You understand? So, any thoughts on how the life course uh, strategy 
could impact uh, routine immunization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very poignant question. We'll take your next question and then come back to the panel. Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Mia Shailovic from Croatia on behalf of International Youth Health Organization as well. Uh, thank you firstly for the very informative session here. And uh, during the last year working as a young health professional in quite a rural area among the population of elderly who are at the same time, let's say, lower educated, I have encountered quite high resistance toward the vaccination, especially COVID and uh, flu vaccines, without any specific reason. My question would be, are there any, let's say, tips and tricks how to battle that on, let's say, primary care level among the population that doesn't actually have quite an access to policies, uh, educational materials, and so on? Thank you. Thank you. And can I just acknowledge you and your colleague from the youth movement? Um, it's great to have you with us today. I'm not being ageist, but a life course approach to try and understand the challenges and the solutions is what we need to have. Um, the, the issue of equity belongs to all of us, every single one of us. And I think everybody's got a role to play in reducing this in our work. But Diane, would you like to just um, have a, sure. a first shot? And I want to say a big thank you for your question and your comment as well. So um, I had the great privilege of being part of the Pfizer response team to the pandemic and the, the development of the vaccine. So I can say hand on heart that we reached out to all countries around the world at the same time. There was no... Um, you know, question of some countries being prioritised over others. You know, there was definitely equity at the heart of our approach during the development of the vaccine and its rollout. Some governments wanted to engage with us more quickly than others. And I would say that for, for us, you know, equity is at the heart of everything that we are doing. And we are continuing to focus on that. If you look at the number of doses delivered globally, Chair. Yeah, yeah look, thank you. We're, we're going to keep, keep moving. Keep okay. moving. Um, but please, we're, we're here uh, over the break. Um, I do want to turn to the question of that uh, my colleague from Slovenia, Croatia, Croatia. Croatia you know, talked about. And we often, Michael, talk about the social determinants of health, you know, that give rise to some of the barriers and, and challenges and opportunities. So I'd like you to sort of respond to that. And then we're going to start wrapping up and I'm going to ask each of our panelists one question. So, Michael. I think that we can actually learn from the anti-vax movement. They give very simple, very simple uh, information which persuades people against vaccination. And I think that on the one hand, we have to understand the evidence. We have to understand why we're saying something reasonably simple and straightforward. And, you know, we start with vaccine works and we give a simple example. Why is polio almost eliminated? Only seven cases so far this year. It's vaccination. Why was smallpox eliminated? It's vaccination. So for people who say it doesn't work, they're wrong. It does work. And, uh, and, they, and similarly, we can use uh, simple messages. Are there any harm from vaccinations? Yes, it does uh, sometimes. On very, very, very rare occasions, uh, harm some people. We call that adverse incidents. But we know that the harm to uh, people who don't vaccinate is much, much, much greater than any very minor harm from vaccine. So we, you know, those sort of messages we keep them simple. By the way, I don't think it matters whether they're rural populations or broader populations. Um, and I think that's a lesson I learned in politics, that, yes, you've got your evidence, but you do simple, straightforward messages. So as we start wrapping up, I'm going to pose one question to the whole panel and ask them to respond to it. Um, we would all say that the pan pandemic is still with us. The emergency may be off to the side, but also we've heard that there's another pandemic coming somewhere down the road. So as we go into this winter season, we know the urgency 
of people being educated, informed, vaccinated, access, etc., etc. But this same urgency does not seem to be out there. So from each of you, from each of your perspectives, from FIP, from the World Federation and from Pfizer, what would your call to action and key message be to the audience, but also to governments? So I'm going to reverse the order and start with Gonzo. Thank you, Jane. Um, yes, I think that the key message we would highlight is really to think differently about pharmacies, uh, to think about leveraging these, uh, this resource that is already in place, this qualified network, to address all these challenges that we've been uh, identifying in our conversations, not only the poor coverage of adult vaccination rates in most countries, but also the, the problems that exist in terms of confidence in vaccines and the lack of awareness of the value of vaccines for uh, people of across all ages. So my one message, and it even addresses the issue of equity and use of resources in health yeah. systems, because if you use that resource that is already there, then your whole health system becomes more efficient and sustainable. So that's my one message. Thank, Thank you. you. And Michael? It sort of builds on what uh, Gonzo has uh, argued, and that is to ensure, to ensure equity between nations, within nations and so forth. Get your infrastructure in place. It starts with universal health care, but uh, really emphasise your readiness and your preparedness by having your infrastructure in, in place and, uh, and keep in mind that the importance of doing that is to achieve an equitable outcome because everybody is entitled to good health as a human right. Thank you, Michael. Diane? And I would, I would build on, on what Michael and Gonzo have just said. I think for, for me, we need to really think about the importance of prioritising life course immunisation. And I think making those links that actually investing in um, adult immunisation, you know, at, 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 you know, across that life course, but particularly in, in adults at the moment, not only saves lives, but it also helps prepare health systems for future health emergencies, as well as helping recover from the current, um, you know, emergency phase of the, fa the pandemic. And I'd also like to kind of highlight the importance of vaccines in helping mitigate the impact of antimicrobial resistance I think that's another really important point. Okay, thank you. So as we come to the close of this important session, unlocking the potential of a life course approach to immunisation or even the potential of immunisation for all ages, I want to thank you. My closing message is we need to be bold, courageous and work across sectors and across disciplines. There is no one organisation, whether it's WHO or IFA or FIP or Bayer or Sanofi, we can't do it by ourselves. And unless we come together in a common agenda, we are not going to be able to drive towards implementation that saves lives. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you.